You are listening to the Nature's Premier Podcast, episode 67. Interview with award-winning wildlife artist, Carla Grace. Here on the Nature's Premier Podcast, we talk about everything from bees to babies and sustainable living. Join us while we talk about natural parenting and different ways to live a more sustainable lifestyle for ourselves and our future generations to come. Now let's begin. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode here on the Nature's Premier Podcast. I am your host, Brooke Nichols, and I am blessed to be back here with you all today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode. I am so excited to jumpstart 2019 with this episode today and the guest that we have on. She is someone that I've been following for, I don't even know, quite a while. Um, I've screenshotted so many of her artworks her paintings. Uh, she actually has work that's a part of like my dream boards for things that I want to have in my home. And I have to say, like, I have a very strong connection to the work that Carla does. Now, in the actual interview, which I was such a fangirl, by the way, doing, and I apologize, I'm human, but I'm a big fan of her work. She mentions how her paintings are not, you know, created with a message from the actual artist, from herself. It's more of like a blank canvas to really bring out what's already in you. And I have to say, when I look at her artwork, it just, it, it's almost like a call of the wild, you know, it brings me back to my, my roots, right. Of wanting to just be in nature of almost being in this elusive home that I always feel like I'm being called to, which truthfully is Africa. Um, fun fact, I've wanted to visit Africa my whole life and I'm actually getting the opportunity to go to Zimbabwe possibly this spring. So I'm very excited about that. But I have to say that her her work is wild and it really does pull out my love of wildlife, my love of conservation, and my love of wanting to make a difference in our environment to preserve natural habitats and to really, you know, bring awareness to our dying, you know, wildlife and our dying world around us. So her work is, again, fascinating. I am such a big fan and I'm really excited to introduce her to you guys today. Um, you know, even if you're someone that is not even really into conservation, but you're into beautiful paintings, she has an extreme raw talent. She's self-taught and she's someone that you could really learn a lot from and admire her paintings. I mean, she's absolutely incredible and I'm excited to have her on the show today. Carla grew up in South Africa, Zimbabwe, New Zealand, Zambia, and Australia. So she has quite the mixed cultural background. But the most poignant memories for her is her time that she had spent in Africa, especially Zimbabwe. She experienced wildlife in the most intense way that anyone can, which has been the largest influence in her work today. She studied fine art in New Zealand, but dropped out after getting her diploma as it did not fit her conceptual academic model of the degree. After she dropped out, she moved to Australia, which is where she pursued becoming a full-time artist. She has been a finalist in the David Shepherd Wildlife Artist of the Year competition and won an award for excellence in painting this year. She is blessed to be able to do this full time and hopes that everyone finds some beauty in each piece that she creates. Carla, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you. So I am absolutely just enamored with your work. Um, it's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. And I'm just a big fan of art. So can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got into, you know, painting such just majestic artwork? Yeah, sure. Um, so my story is a little bit uh, all over the place because we've immigrated between countries quite a few times growing up and sort of each stage of my life has had pretty big influences from those moves. Um, so I think the biggest move was in 2006 where we moved from New Zealand to Zambia. So I was 14 years old and we sort of, we, the first year we lived in Zambia was in a very pretty, um, out in the middle of nowhere on a farm, didn't really have electricity or sort of any friends. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time at home and, and I drew. I just spent a lot of time drawing and I focused on birds because um, we had a lot of bird life on the farm and it was just sort of an outlet, I think, um, just to see how far I could push myself mm -hmm. to really captivate each bird. And so then I started realizing, oh, I'm 
kind of good at this. Um, so I just sort of kept pushing myself further and further and then um, it just sort of grew from there and I started doing more detailed wildlife drawings. Um, and then when I could get better art supplies, then I would sort of push it a little bit further. But everyone would ask me what I want to do when I grow up and it would never be, I want to be an artist. Um, there's just too much stereotype around being an artist, the whole starving artist um, story that you're told as a kid. So I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, until I think I left school when I was 19 and I moved to New Zealand to do a bit of study. Um, and it just became something I ended up doing because I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful yeah. talent. Now, is there, um, now what makes you focus on wildlife? Like, because looking through all of your artwork, it's, um, they're beautiful, but it's, there's a main focus on like animals and wildlife. And is that just from yeah. where you grew up or is there like a lot, is there like a deeper conservation meaning behind your artwork? Yeah, I think everything um, when it comes to wildlife and, and painting them with the amount of respect and detail that I do, um, the always the subconscious message I think behind all my work is is that people get to experience the animal um, as real as possible. Uh, when I was a child, I grew up in Zimbabwe and oh, it was, it was during a time Zimbabwe? where there was so much wildlife we had elephants in our backyard our lake our lawn sort of ended in the lake where we had hippos and crocodiles so i've had a very real um very raw experience with wildlife uh and i think that's why i focus on a more realistic representation of them because i try and portray um that that experience with them uh, as much as I can in, in the painting. Um, so when people see it in real life, it doesn't really come through as strong in, in the photographs, but in real life, the painting, it has a real presence in the room. Like you feel like, oh, it's going to jump off the canvas yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. So my, so my focus is more an experience of the animal rather than, um, a message from the artist per se. So it's it's probably been stripped back quite a bit where I almost remove myself completely uh, from the painting. I think that's sort of where realism um, catches a bit of a, a snag in the art world because it sort of focuses on what messages the artist trying to convey, mm -hmm. what is the artwork telling you about the artist, uh, where the realism, the artist almost removes themselves completely from from the final product where it becomes more about what you're looking at and what you receive from that than, than a deep sort of conceptual message behind it. So that's why I want to do realistic wildlife because you experience that animal in a very unique way through that painting. Oh, wow. That's actually a really deep uh, answer. And uh, that really oh. makes <laughs> a lot of sense. Cause you know, some people are always like, oh, well, you know, I'm a part of like the World Wildlife Fund and there's always like something or yeah. now I'm not saying like all artists, but you know, there's always that something, but it does make Absolutely. a lot, it does yeah. make a lot of sense. And I did read how you start with the eyes first on a lot yeah. of the paintings. Yeah. So it does, it, it really does kind of like, I guess it is up for interpretation almost from the person who's actually looking at the painting um, because I'm, I'm a big conservationist and that's what I see. I always see like, you know, the beauty of the animal and the struggles that they deal with and, and things yeah. of that nature. Exactly. That sort of, um, it sort of comes without sort of the effort of my intentional message. So a lot of artists will incorporate other elements into the painting to enhance the message that they're trying to portray. Mm -hmm. Whereas I sort of, I don't know if it's a personality thing. I'm very organized and my house is very simplistic and minimal. I like there to be no clutter. Yeah, I'm saying <laughs> so, <right. laughs> Yeah, it sort of comes through uh, in the painting. They're not cluttered. There's not a lot going on in terms of um, hidden messages and things like that. It's sort of just a raw experience with the animal. And quite a lot of people have said, oh, well, you're just copying a photograph, you know, why not print off the photo? Um, but there's something uh, very unique about it being done by hand. Uh, there's a lot of care and precision that goes into replicating something to the point where it feels alive um which you know you can get from a photograph but 
as a painting, you've really had to overcome patience and, you know, wanting to really achieve that, um, which comes out from deep respect and love for what you're painting to really, you know, hit that on the head. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you said, it's funny that you said you grew up in, in Zimbabwe. I actually am going to Zimbabwe. Um, oh, I, awesome. have, I have a good, I've never left America. I haven't left America yet, but a good friend of mine, he, um, his name's Tanache Basa. He runs Zim Kids out of, uh, out of Zimbabwe and they're like oh, an orphanage. Cool. Um, and he just, he talks about, he makes comments about like, uh, you know, he had, um, I think like a bam, like a bamboo. I don't, I don't know what you guys call it. Like a, I'm, I'm trying to think, um, baboon, I think, right? <laughs> a baboon, yes, right? Yeah. So like, and he said it was by his truck and I'm like, really? And he says how he would see lions. And I'm like, what do you just go up and pet the lions? And he's like, no, but you see them. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about how growing up in, in Zimbabwe, like, cause obviously that had a deep impact on, on your experience as an adult now, especially as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Oh, we just had the most incredible childhood in Zimbabwe. It was before um, sort of all the war vets started taking over. So we, we left Zimbabwe um, under pressure. So we, mm -hmm. we fled to New Zealand. Um, but before that all started happening, we had so much wildlife. Um, when the lake was really low in the early 90s, we would have, there was an elephant path that went in front of our house. Um, so we'd get herds of elephant just moseying past us. And then obviously as the water rose higher and higher, um, the elephants would come closer and closer. And we had quite a few instances where an elephant would obviously feel a little bit um, claustrophobic in, in sort of village um, surroundings and, and they would sort of mock charge at our house and things like that. Really? Um, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah thinking about it now from living in a first world country just those memories i'm just like wow just blows my mind um at night time it was a little bit of a danger to go outside on the lawn because the hippos would come up and eat the grass um oh, wow. during the day the crocodiles would sun themselves on the edge of our lawn um and we would go for drives uh just like outside of kariba into um the kaburi wilderness in an open back 10 ton um, truck. Us kids would all be sitting in the back, mum and dad in the front, and we'd just be driving along the road and we'd stop next to a pride of lions. Really? For some reason, and my dad would just be like, oh, this is cool, and we're all <laughs> sitting in an open back um, truck thinking, oh, we're a bit close here. Well, what could happen here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel a bit exposed, but yeah, and it was very relaxed. Um, and we just recently uh, went to Tanzania on a, um, a bit of an adventure bucket list sort of trip. We climbed Kilimanjaro and then we went on sort of four day safari um, with my in-laws and my husband. It was the first time they'd been to Africa. And I was amazed at how much knowledge I still had about um, the wildlife. And I sort of sounded like a bit of a know-it-all, but I was just so happy with all my <laughs> retained knowledge from my childhood. Um, it's just a really special experience, even as a child. And then again, now as an adult, I just, it's sort of breathtaking being around those sort of animals. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried just because I, I feel like I'm just going to be so giddy and I'm going to take a million pictures and I'll probably get mauled by like yeah. <laughs> something. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. You know, and one thing that, um, you know, it's funny what you just to circle back what you said about, you know, the paintings evoking certain feelings and whatnot. Um, one thing that it brings back to me is that um, it's always been a life, a lifelong dream for me to visit Africa. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that Africa is under a lot of they're Africa's dying, you know, you have poaching, yeah. you have, there's so many problems and there's such beauty, but there's also a lot of sadness and there's also a lot going on. And that's why I love your artwork as well, because it really does at least ignite curiosity or at least it hope, I hope it does yeah. for some people to see like, Oh yeah, this, this animal's beautiful. And you learn about, you know, um, you know, their, their native land and whatnot, but it really is under pressure. And a lot of these animals, especially ones that you paint are, are, you know, on the endangered species list, or they might not yeah. even be here yeah. in 15 years. Exactly. Yeah. So you might find um, when you go to Zimbabwe that it'll only be in the national reserves where you find the animals. Uh, whereas growing up as a child, like we had them roaming around through the village, you know, a herd of zebras just crossing the road in town sort of a thing. Whereas now it's they've all been sort of killed off mm -hmm. um, or chased away or been threatened. 
um, a lot of poaching, a lot of snares, traps and things uh, end up killing the animals. So you might find that um, it really is only when you go into the, the game reserves that you see the wildlife. Um, often a lot of people, with the first time they go to Africa, they think, oh, they're going to see, you know, lions on the runway when they land. And it's, it's really not like that at all. Um, so there is quite a um, depletion of, of wildlife. Um, and I've noticed it since, you know, my childhood memories and then going back. So there's like, which is quite sad. there's like protected land that they can go in. Yes. Um, and that's pretty much the only place where you'll find, um, wildlife is in, is in the Nas national reserves oh, where okay. they're protected by, um, the, the game reserve, um, authorities. Yeah. Um, but it was quite interesting when we were, because we went to the Serengeti and, and a couple other game reserves in Tanzania, um, the animals were so relaxed around all the cars and um, it was almost like they didn't really care that we were there, which goes to show that the, um, the park rangers and the safari guides have done really, really good work with um, with the parks and sticking to the rules and not pestering the animals. So there is still um, a lot of growth as well in the wildlife reserve where, where people are really respecting um, and allowing nature to be as it is, which is awesome to see. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I just always ask stories because it's so different, you know, when you live, like I live in America, yeah. I live in New York, I'm literally on the other side of the world. And it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, it literally, and it's just fascinating, you know, because a lot of people, you know, whatever's happening here, they ki kind of live in a bubble. And understandably, so it's a first world country, there's no real threats. But then when I, yeah. when I talk with someone like Tanache, and he tells me about, you know, the, the issues that the children have, and, you know, the animals and the poaching that happens over there, you know, you have a lot of Americans that go there pay top dollar, to, to you yeah. know, get these animals heads on their wall, you know, back in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, it's, it's infuriating. Yeah, it's, it's got, it's so deplorable, de deplorable. And, you know, people yeah. here, they don't, it doesn't, it's not like in their circle, so they don't really care, you know? So like, mm. that's another reason why I always try to like, bring people on. So it's kind of like, no, everything affects one another. Like we need these animals here. They're here for their own reasons. Like we can't just have them go because somebody wants to be, you know, a scumbag and like hunt them and, you know. Absolutely, um, yeah it's really it's really heartbreaking now are you familiar with cecil the lion i'm sure I'm, i don't know if it was as big as it was over there as it was here yeah i believe so was it the dentist yeah so his yeah. whole his whole thing was how they he was in a protected park and they like lured him out illegally like they like lured him away and then they yeah they, they killed him so it's things like that you know his he had a name so people were in you know like so pissed off they were so upset but there's mm -hmm. so many more animals that ha don't have names that have the same situation happen to them and it's uh it's just very sad you know so it's like yeah i wish more people understood what was happening and um you know really kind of put more thought into it because if these animals are gone they're gone forever they're not coming back absolutely um yeah and you know numbers of the animals are countable um and i think that's that goes to show, you know, a species, there should be so many, it's beyond count kind of thing, but right. everything has, has a number to it. They know exactly how many of each animal is in the park, um, which, you know, it's, at least they know, but it is sad. And China's just recently lifted the ban on, on the ivory trade after 25 years. And their excuse is that it um, allows um, the sale of, farmed animal ivory and you know died of natural causes and so it just sort of oh really i didn't know how that. do you how do you win <laughs> oh i didn't know that that's uh they just lifted that ban yeah yeah oh. that was it became a bit of a story um just a few weeks ago oh. Well, we have so the car. I'm not we sure have what's, car, we what have the, the development is yet there, but yeah, well, we have. Well, I'm pretty I, sad about it. It's probably about a Kardashian, you know, Kim Kardashian dress oh. over here. You know what I mean? So let's be honest, you know, like, yeah, um, or or our president, you know, it's one of those things. Um, oh gosh, yeah. But uh, you know, one thing is too is that you made a good comment about animals being countable. Now they say that tigers. Um, there are more tigers in U.S. households as pets than there are in the wild. I mean, if that doesn't tell you oh, that wow. there's a yeah. crisis, you know, you know, there's more amazing. tigers yeah. in people's houses. It's absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, no, that's wild. So now just to just to circle back to, to um, your artwork real quick. What what are some of 
like the animals that you love to paint? Like what's some of your favorite type of work that you've done in the past? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think wolves and um, big cats. For some reason, I'm just really drawn to more the big game, so more predator sort of animals. Um, I think because I I don't see them as scary. Yeah. I, like they a lion. If I were to go walk through the African bush, a lion would be the last thing I'd worry about. Really. Um. Yeah, it's more a buffalo. That would be the biggest danger. I remember running next to the car throughout in the bush when I was a kid because I just loved to run long distance for some reason. And mum would be like, okay, but watch out for buffalo. It was never, lions were never an issue. I didn't know that. I thought they just attacked you out of nowhere. No, so they they only really need to eat once a week. Yeah. Um, So, and they're the top of the food chain. They don't need to worry about, (laughs) you know, anything. (laughs) So, um, yeah, uh, I think I'm attracted to the, the predators because I think they have the most misunderstanding around them uh they're seen as or there are more people like them because they're so ferocious and they're so powerful um so i'm more attracted to, to them because they have that power and that association of being you know the king uh but they're very gentle as well so i've just recently done a big painting of a, of a male lion and he's just looking straight at the viewer and he's just coming from a place of total calm. I saw um, that. That's probably like my favorite painting, truthfully. Yeah, and there's it. so much power coming through him as well, but he's just so chilled, and you just feel this sort of contrast between that that huge personality and that strength, and then he just he's just watching you, almost being like, so what do we do next? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> sort of like, he's in my dining room and I think I have a different conversation with him every day. Oh, <laughs> sort that's of, yeah. awesome. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. I saw that picture. It's very, there's a very strong presence. It's, um, it's very interesting. How are you led? To, do you know which animals you're going to paint next? Are they on request? Like how does that work as far as your actual, like, like business model goes? Do you just get led or called to a certain type of animal? Um, that's actually quite an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I think I'll also, I work with photographers all over the world because I'm often not able to get, you know, a photograph of a grizzly bear from Adelaide by myself. So I work closely with photo photographers who are able to, to get to places I'm not able to. And usually it'll start with an idea. I feel like, oh, I haven't, painted a wolf in a while I'll look for wolf photos but then I might see something else pop up and I just sort of get led down a rabbit hole and the photograph that I choose may not be a great photograph in itself Um, it's chosen based on the feeling that I get from that photograph in terms of the connection with the animal Um, so it's a it's a particular pose or a look in the eye that I'm drawn to um, and I just sort of very intuitively, I guess, choose um, choose an image that I feel uh, drawn to. Um, and I usually bounce all my ideas off my husband because I obviously look at things based on, oh, it's got three different textures on it and it's got wet fur, dry fur, and it's got clumps of clay, but it might not actually come across as a cool picture to look at. So I'll pick out a few different options and then I'll get my husband to choose it because he's just looking at it based on the visual value of it which is what people will see when I actually finish the painting. Um, so my husband is sort of my, um, my go-to when it comes to the final choice of the image. That's nice. It's nice to have another set of eyes. Um, I know you mentioned uh, exactly about doing a wolf. I actually saw, I've never seen a wolf before. I saw a wolf at Yellowstone National Park at like, two o'clock in the morning this past um, oh, wow. just back in September. And I have to say, they really take your breath away, man. Like they, we thought, it yeah. was, I thought it was a dog. So, like, why would I think I'm in the middle of the Yellowstone National Park where wolves are, and I'm thinking it's like like a Rottweiler or something, and then it was just huge gray and black wolf, and it was dark, so it was hard to see, but it was absolutely yeah. stunning, and I'm like, wow, like, I, it just, it takes your breath away, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know if they have wolves in Zimbabwe, it's probably a stupid question, no. but, <laughs> but it's crazy, you know? No wolves. Oh, I'd love to go to the Yellowstone Park and see wolves in the flesh. I think they're just, something about a wolf that just... Ugh, gives me shivers. It I don't was, know. yeah, it was. And my husband's like, uh, 
I was like, is that a dog? He's like, it's a wolf. Like, it's, don't, don't, don't see if it's okay. It's a wolf. And it was just walking. And it was huge. It was beautiful. Yeah. And I got Oof. my camera. I got my phone. And I'm shaking. And then the thing runs away. I was like, no. no. <laughs> so, but yeah, Yellowstone. Yellowstone really uh, should be on your bucket list. It's an, it's incredible. The only, yeah, the only issue is, is that it's, absolutely. Uh, the only problem is, you know, with anything else, like, there's so many tourists. And they're, it's depleting yeah. the actual, like, per, you know, the whole area. But other than that, you know, you have grizzly bears. You have wolves. You have... Uh, mountain goats you have buffalo mm, yep. which are very aggressive um, like you said <laughs> but uh but no anyway so that's uh you know that that was just a great uh, incredible experience now for someone who's interested who's listening to the podcast right now we have a lot of families a lot of people who are into environmentalism and conservation and things of the like how would they you know if they want to request a painting because obviously you're very talented you're very passionate how would they go about placing an order with you like how does that process work is it like an auction like how does that work oh it's it's Pretty simple. Um, I work directly with um, with my collectors, so they just send me an email. It's very personal. Um, it's done directly with me. I don't have anyone else really doing um, the the management business side of it. I do everything. Um, so if anyone has, you know, even their own photographs um, that they would love painted, they just send me an email with sort of their ideas, and we can bounce ideas back and forth. Um, I can pursue um, photographers. So like I'm working with a a client in New York actually um, for a snow leopard painting that they'd really love done. Um, They found the photographer and rough idea of photographs that they would like. So I've pursued the photographer and gotten their permission and they're super excited to see the painting happen as well. And um, yeah, we just sort of see how it goes, but it's all done just personal correspondence. It's nice and easy. And it's all different sizes. And if what if they want postcards? Like, what's like, what's your range of paintings go? Or is it just actual standard canvases? Uh, so I prefer to work larger scale. Okay. Uh, just because I can include more detail and make it more lifelike that way. Right. Um, so my re- the smallest thing I think I'll do is maybe forty centimeter square, and then it, I can go as large as anyone is daring to go. Really. Um, <laughs> I like working on panel just because it's nice and smooth um, and then it's also more durable for shipping. So everything that I paint is shipped ready to hang. It's all framed, ready to go. So you get it and just put it straight on your wall. Um, So yeah, it just comes down to almost your budget and what I'm able to do for that budget. I have a gigantic yeah. white wall and I might challenge you on how big you want to paint. <laughs> I'm serious because I, 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 your, your paintings are like you just, that's all you need to hang on your wall. I mean, that's, it's right there. It's that, that's like, yeah, that's that's the decoration. So where could, where can our listeners find you? Where can they find out more information about your artwork? Uh, My most um, useful port of call is my website. So it's www.carlagraceart.com. My Instagram is also really good. I do get lots of messages on Instagram though. So the best way to contact me is via email, which you can get through my website. And I do have a little email button on my Instagram homepage, uh, which comes straight through to my phone. So I can, I usually respond straight away unless I'm asleep. Okay, cool. And is there any like takeaways that you want to give to our listeners today about your work? Uh, Oh, I don't know. Not a trick question. (laughs) A lot of people are really drawn to my work um, based on a personal connection that they have with the animals. So I get a lot of, um, you know, spirit animals, um, people that have or even had a personal experience with an animal. Um, Sometimes it's not just purely visual value um Mm -hmm. sometimes there is a a deeper connection and I just want to encourage people if you do have a a real deep connection with an animal um tell me about it I love to hear those stories um I love to know that my work is reaching people more than just the visual sort of side of things also because I love wildlife um I love to hear how other people are connected with them as well it's really cool to hear those stories well, that's awesome. Well, I am certainly a huge fan of your work, and I am definitely going to order something. I have to figure it out. Um, may, <laughs> may do it a gigantic scale just to be annoying, or I might just do like a normal type of painting, but I have to figure it out. But uh, I absolutely love your work, and definitely check her out at CarlaGraceArt.com and also on her Instagram at CarlaGraceArt. Um, thank you so much, Carla, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It was an awesome chat. That wraps up our interview with Carla Grace 
award-winning wildlife artist. Check out her amazing work on Instagram at Carla underscore Grace underscore art. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. It has been an absolute pleasure. Well, everyone, that wraps up another episode here on the Nature's Premier Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I am so excited to be back and offer more interesting videos and episodes for you all today in the coming year of 2019. If you haven't already, please make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast so we can get out there to really introduce these types of artists, these types of topics, and really just bring the energy and awareness of conservation and natural parenting and everything in between bees and babies, my friends, everything between bees and babies. And just to give you guys a quick a reminder, we do have our weekly Facebook live show, The Nature's Premiere live show. I'm still figuring out a name. So do check it out. We do it Saturday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you are in another part of the world, just do a playback. Check us out at the Nature's Premier Podcast, where we talk about weekly topics, you know, things pertaining to the environment, conservation, and what have you. So I am signing off today, but I hope everybody has a wonderful, amazing week ahead. Take care, and I will check you back again on the next episode. Take care, friends.